Happy 4th of July weekend. 
Um, thanks for joining us all online today for our service. I hope that you guys have all enjoyed yourselves, whether it was a barbecue, a parade, a bonfire, or just getting to spend some extra time with friends and family. We're going to start out today with our announcements. Uh, first is our water baptisms. So just a reminder, this is next Sunday. Um, and it is at Bass Lake, immediately following our worship. And if you have not communicated your desire to participate yet, please reach out to Pastor Ned or Allison by tomorrow, Monday, July 8th. All right. And then our VBS is coming up here soon. Super exciting. Start the party. Um, our core one day VBS is happening really soon, though, on July 16th. And you can still register online at livingwatercameron.org slash VBS, so make sure you do that. All right, we're back. <laughs> uh, we had such an amazing experience in Honduras, and of course, we really want to share that with you as we did this as a church, as Living Water, um, and we could not have done that without you and your financial support and prayers. So please come and hear about that on July 21st. We're going to be taking over um, the sermon time that day to really share all of that with you. And if I can tell you one thing, that is that our church, Living Water, showed up. And I'm sure you've seen some things online already on Facebook, but... Um, the spirit of our church was there, and we did amazing work. So please come and join us on Sunday, July 21st to hear more. All right, and mark your calendars. August um, 7th, we're going to have our second Wednesday night light for the summer. How exciting. Um, we had such a great turnout already this summer. It's so fun to get together, listen to worship music outside, have some really great food. My favorite is the fire truck pizza um, and the kitchen clean french fries. Those were a huge hit. So we're looking forward to seeing you on August 7th again for our Wednesday Night Lights. All right, this is our call to worship. I will be the L and you will be the P. Let us sing the good news of God. Who awakens, who awakens us, us with, with dawn's, dawn's embrace, who surrounds us with joy and life. Let us offer praise to God in every place with every voice. We rejoice, we rejoice in, in the one who leads us with a gentle hand and a word of hope. Let us join all creation in extolling God from the depths of the sea to the farthest galaxies. We rejoice, we rejoice in, in the, the God who loves us. us. Please join us in our first song.
confession of sin. Our words, our actions, our silence may make it seem that we are on the, that path which hurts others and harms us. But God has destined us for the healing, for hope, for joy. Let us pray to the one who loves us beyond compare. In the winter of our lives, our passion for following Jesus wilts in the chill of indifference. We could walk in the light, but tiptoe through the shadows. Forgive us, Father. Fill us with peace as Jesus gathers us up and brings us home. Amen. Grace upon grace, mercy upon mercy, hope upon hope. These are the gifts God pours out on us in this moment and in all the moments of our lives to come. Thanks be to God. We are filled to overflowing with God's tender love and peace. We are forgiven. Amen. Please join us in, in peace. Uh, maybe those who are maybe in your home or a text to a friend or family member sharing God's peace today. Many ways to give here at Living Water Cameron. Um, you can text, use the Living Water app, use our website, or of course, the next time that you're in-house, our kiosk. The prayer of the day. Again, I'll be the L and you will be the P. Almighty God, to know you is eternal life. Teach us to know your Son as the way, the truth, and the life, and guide us along the way of Jesus Christ our Lord. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns within you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Church, good morning. Good to have you all tuned in with us this morning. Before I start the message, I want to say a quick word of thank you to our team, which gathered here today to record in advance of Sunday morning. So uh, they are Kelly, our worship leader this morning, um, in the booth and up in the high booth. I don't know. We have a name for that, do we? The high booth. We'll call it that. Bambi. Uh, we have Rory and Kurt and Allison. And then up on stage today, Bill and Amy and Brenda and Dave and Julia. We've got a great dedicated team, and we're so thankful to each and every one of them for their ministry of service and their offering of their gifts and talents so we can do this and give everybody a day off to be able to worship at home together as church. You who are loved by the Lord, grace and peace to you all. Amen. Back when I was eight or nine years old, my father bought an old Rambler station wagon. Now, the picture you're going to see on the screen, I think we have a picture. Yep, coming up. Do we have a picture? Yep, there it is. That is a 1955 Rambler station wagon. Now, the one you're seeing on your screen looks way better than the one my father bought. It was very old, very rusty, very broken down, and was owned by our next-door neighbor, Ted Langamo, who gave it to us, sold it to us, for the price of $100. Yes. Now, unlike this one, it was an ugly green color, uh, and its enduring feature was that it didn't work. Like ever, or hardly ever. Now, these were the 1960s. My mother, being the very enterprising, thrifty person she was, decided to redeem the station wagon's outward appearance by making a trip to the downtown Woolworths store. If I can say Woolworths, there we are. Where she bought a bunch of contact paper, white and orange and green, different colors. And out of these, she cut these massively huge flowers. So imagine that, that station wagon you're seeing. 
She put these big flowers on there to decorate the whole thing because it sat in the driveway and she thought, well, it might as well look like something pretty. And she kind of killed two birds with one stone there because that was the side of the house she could never get flowers to grow on. So we had flowers. And on that day, when the flower, excuse me, when the rambler was decorated with flowers, we dubbed her the flower mobile. She was an odd, lovable fixture that we would hang out in. It didn't work. We didn't drive it. So often we would just go sit in it and maybe turn the radio on and listen to the radio. Well, barely a year passed when my father decided it was time to give Flower Mobile a new mission. Our family would be making its one and only appearance in the Glendive, Montana, 4th of July demolition derby. Now, since it didn't run, that was a problem. But neighbor Ted and my dad spent hours and hours getting that baby up and running so that when you turn the key, it would actually start. And to make it even more uh, derby worthy, what they did was they, they borrowed somebody's welder and they welded all these rods all over so that it would be like the most sturdiest entry to a demolition derby ever. Now... What follows next will forever live in the annals of Lenhart family automotive history. I clearly remember sitting up in the fairground bleachers, fairly high so we could get a very good view of the arena in which the contest would take place. It was evening, the sun was setting. Dad and Ted were down in the flower, uh, with the flower mobile rather, in the pit, uh, making some last minute tune-ups, along with a young man from my dad's Votech class, one of his automotive students, who they had somehow convinced to put on a helmet and get behind the wheel of this thing. I'm not sure what they promised him. If it was uh, the thrill of victory, maybe glossing over just a little bit the agony of defeat. Either way, he was there. They were ready. The cars were all paraded around in the first heat. They made a big circle, and then they all came to this like point where they pointed their noses at each other, and in walked the starter. He was in this big outfit, and they're like very bright colors and all kinds of stuff, so they knew clearly not to hit him, right? He pointed to each one of them all the way around like this, gave them their instructions. They all revved their engines. Then they shut them off. We sang the Star Spangled Banner. Yes, we all stood, sang, sat down, started the engines up with relief. Flower Mobile came to life again. And then he held this starter's pistol in his hand. He looked at each one of them. He shot it off and then ran like crazy off to the side so they wouldn't hit him. Now, that is when a car off to the left of Flower Mobile swung in a big, long arc all the way around with a great deal of speed and delivered one powerful blow to Flower Mobile's rear end. We waited and waited, bated breath. Other cars were moving, things were moving, there was all kinds of action. Flower Mobile just sat there. The guy had a helmet on so we couldn't see any expressions on his face, plus we were a long ways away. The whole heat completed, finished, nothing. There was a winner, but Flower Mobile never moved. Come to find out later that that one strong blow to her rear end was all it took to knock the motor off its motor mounts and down, ending her derby hopes and her extended now short life. There were two rather well liquored guys sitting next to my sisters and my mother and I up there, which probably gave her, who probably gave her the most succinct and accurate eulogy she would ever have. Pointing to Flower Mobile, the one guy said to the other dryly, see that one? That ugly one with the flowers? Yeah, said his buddy. <laughs> and she doesn't even work. At first glance, this uh, passage from the Gospel of Mark we're going to look at here in a second, that's probably what most of us would say about it. It's ugly, uh, no matter how you much you may try to pretty it up. It is as ugly as sin. And B, it doesn't really work. 
Here's the context. Jesus has just sent out his disciples two by two into the surrounding towns and villages to do what he's been doing, to, to heal the sick, to cast out demons, tell the good news. You know, big, important, powerful, kingdom-building, faith-growing, life-changing stuff. When the gospel writer Mark interrupts the story to share this breaking news about John the Baptist. We'll start at verse 17. Herod sent soldiers to arrest and imprison John as a favor to Herodias. She had been Brother Philip's wife, but Herod had married her. John had been telling Herod, it is against God's law for you to marry your brother's wife. So Herodias bore a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But without Herod's approval, she was powerless. For Herod respected John. And knowing that he was a good and holy man, he protected him. Herod was greatly disturbed whenever he talked with John, but even so, he liked to listen to him. Now, let's be plain about one thing. Herod was an ugly man in every sense of the word. Uh, but what really riled the feathers of John the Baptist was this. Herod had Herod's own brother, Philip, killed, and then he married that brother's wife, Herodias. A clear violation of Torah law on many levels. John, everywhere he went, made it really clear how he felt. That's wrong, he'd say. Herod's wrong. And he would point that out to anyone who would listen. So what did Herod do? The only thing Herod could think of doing, taking John, arresting him, locking him up, putting him down in a dungeon where no one would ever see or hear from him again. Problem solved, right? But Herodias, new wife, not enough for her. She has it out for John. She does not like what John has been saying. Those arrows landed in his heart, her heart rather, and she was not happy. So she's thinking, okay, he's down, but he's not out. I'm going to grab an opportunity when I can and finish this guy off. And pretty soon, she does. We continue verse 21. Herodias' chance finally came on Herod's birthday. He gave a party for his high government officials, army officers, and the leading citizens of Galilee. Then his daughter, also named Herodias, how about that, came in and performed a dance that greatly pleased Herod and his guests. Ask me for anything you like, the king said to the girl, and I will give it to you. He even vowed, I will give you whatever you ask up to half my kingdom. Clearly been drinking, right? You can see it though, right? Big party, lots of important people, room full of, of the snooty types. Everybody's had too much to drink. The daughter's on stage. She's putting up moves that would make a sailor blush. And is he the decent father who puts a stop to it? No. He just lets it keep going, and he lets it keep going and going. And with the room smiling and clapping and yelling for more, 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 Herod says, oh, man, that was amazing, honey. What would you like? Would you like a pony? A trip to the mall? Uh, maybe a party with your friends? A an Amazon gift card? Name it. It's yours. Uh, she says, wait a minute. Let me talk to mom. They have a little conversation off to the side. She comes back and she says, ah, just one thing. Half of the kingdom, you can keep that. I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Verse 27. So he, Herod, uh, immediately sent an executioner to the prison to cut off John's head and bring it to him. The soldier beheaded John in the prison, brought his head on a tray, and gave it to the girl who took it to her mother. When John's disciples heard what had happened, they came to get his body and buried it in a tomb. The deed, the deed is done. The head is presented. And Mark ends this sad, grotesque episode by saying this. And the disciples, remember they had been sent out two by two to do kingdom's work? The disciples returned to Jesus, telling him all they had done and taught. Now, who say all you want about this story, but the bottom line seems to be what? A, it's ugly. There's X-rated dancing. There's a murder conspiracy. There's a gruesome beheading. And B, it doesn't work. 
The disciples go out to do mission work, right? To do kingdom work. They come back to report all kinds of success. And in the middle, Mark inserts this little story of something that had happened to John the Baptist. What is going on? Any guesses? I'll tell you what I think is going on. Mark is sending to us a not-so-subtle message of the two worlds into which you and I must walk when we decide to be followers of Jesus. The two very different, very contrasting worlds that we move through when we say we're going to be a disciple of Christ. It's like this. You and I, we're baptized. Could be at any age, as a tiny baby or middle, old, doesn't matter. We're baptized, right? We're, we're claimed by God. We're brought into the kingdom. We're made a son or daughter of the king. At that point and thereafter, we have a ton of choices, right? We can choose to be disciples, followers. That's what a disciple is, right? We can choose to be that or not. We can choose to follow Jesus in faith every day or not. We can choose to read the Bible daily. We can choose to pray daily. We can choose to have an ongoing conversation with our Lord and Maker daily or not. We can choose to attend weekly worship in person or as we're doing this morning online or not. We can choose to go out into the world as Christ's hands and feet and ears and eyes and heart or not. Here's the thing. If we, do, if we do choose to go out and do kingdom's work, if we choose to follow Jesus, if we choose to be faithful, if we choose to take that path, just as the disciples, while we're out there, wow, we're going to do great things. You know, what did Jesus say to his disciples? You know, you, you saw me healing and raising the dead, making the blind see the deaf here. You're going to do that and even greater things. And you know what? When you come back here on the 21st, that's exactly what you're going to hear of what happened to our missionaries that we sent to Honduras. You're going to hear that. You're going to be infected, bitten by a mission bug. I, I promise you that. And the world, the world into which we are sent as we go Know this, it's also the world of Herod. It's a mean world. It's an unkind world. It's a spiteful world. It's a hateful world. It's a world to which we go into knowing, knowing Mark wants us to know full well that they will reject us just as they rejected the king at times, and it will be painful. It's a world that just as they punish Jesus, they will punish us for living that truth that is in us. Yet in the face of all this, Mark wants us to know this that the kingdoms of this world have limited power. The kingdoms of this world have a very, very short shelf life. They last for a short time. The kingdom of God, not so much. The kingdom of God goes on and on and on forever and ever and ever. Amen. The kingdom to which you and I belong when we are adopted as children of God in the waters of baptism. It's an eternal kingdom. There is no beginning. There is no ending. And while the kingdoms and the herods of this world sometimes seem to be winning the battle and the pain that they can push on us can see, be just excruciating and awful and, and, and unexplicably terrible, every once in a while, in the midst of it, God gives us a glimpse of the victory that is ours in Christ Jesus as sons and daughters of the Father. Did you miss it? If you did, let me tell you about a story that was shared this week as the networks were moving back and forth uh, with us viewers between events and heats and all those things that were part of the Olympic trials. I know some of you were probably glued to your screens, so maybe you saw this. Hope Morgan Ward she is a volunteer for Special Olympics in charge of lane five in the 100-meter dash. Gun goes off. Race starts. Hope is doing all she can to encourage her student in lane five to go. Go, she says. Go. You can do it. Come on. Come on. Keep going. You can make it. You're doing it. You're doing great. The grinning student's running towards her. He's just as happy as can be. Arms flailing. Arms, legs moving. He's moving down the lane, doing great, getting closer and closer and closer to Hope. And then suddenly he slows down. And he stops, and he turns around, and he stands there, waiting for his friend. 
And when his friend catches up, they run together. Yep, they run together with matching strides across the finish line and embracing each other. They yell, we tied, we tied, we tied, yay, we tied. The judge is shaking his head because the computer scoring program doesn't pro- program rather does not allow for a tie in the event there's no way to record it to label it to name it but they kept insisting we tied we tied we tied oh what happened let me tell you what happened that day into the world of winners and losers we were shown a glimpse of another world yeah it's called the world They called it the world of the tie, Uh, a world where it's more blessed to run together than it is to win the race alone, a world where it's more blessed to lift up the other than to lift up and promote yourself. Blessed be the tie. Jesus said it in other words elsewhere in Matthew's gospel, blessed be the pure in heart, Blessed be the world to come. Blessed be the kingdom to come. Blessed be the kingdom of God, which is even now peeking through into our world, reminding us that God is here. Even when we can't see him with these eyes, we can see them with these eyes. God is here. God is in charge. And to God will go the ultimate victory and the triumph. (laughs) Flower mobile. Oh, man. Ooh, I wish I could show you a real picture of her. Yeah. She's ugly, the guy said. Yeah, said the guy next to him. And she doesn't even work. Man, this story, it's an ugly thing, isn't it? Uh, it's gross. It's just gross. There's no mistaking that. But you know what, church? When you think about it, when you look at it a little deeper, what do we know? It does work. It works because it shows us the cost of following Jesus. And what may and sometimes does happen when we choose to be a disciple, when we choose to follow Jesus. Ooh, but Mark, uh, the gospel writer, you know, thank goodness for him. He doesn't let us leave this story all down and gloomy and sad. No, he gives us a, a word of good news. He leaves us on a note of hope. And one, let me tell you, we cannot live without. The hope is this, that, that we who live in that promise, the promise of our baptism, that the victory that Jesus achieved on the cross, that's our victory too. It's God's and ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. To which you and me today and all God's people can say, thank God and amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you so much for the witness of Scripture and for the bold people who go out every day and live their faith and remind us that you are real, you're a God of love, you're a God of compassion, you care about us, and that there's never a moment that you're not with us, that you're not loving us, that your spirit is not in us and moving us and reminding us that you're alive and faithful and well and, and working to bring your kingdom even in the the darkest and most difficult and problematic of places. Sometimes that's our neighborhood. Sometimes that's our family. Sometimes that's even in the darkness of our own hearts. And Lord, thank you for your persistence that you just keep coming into hard places and and, and challenging places, hopeless places, and, and lifting up and shining your light and saying to us, reminding us that we are salt, we are light. No, we don't have to be salt. We don't have to be light. We are that. You, you make that, that claim of us and for us. And Lord, may we just, just grab hold of that with both arms and, and allow that light to shine in us. There's plenty of places that are, are full of darkness. And Lord, uh, we can each name those dark places. We can each name the Herods that we deal with too. Sometimes that's the person on the road next to us in a car. Sometimes that's the customer we're trying to deal with or a patient we're treating or, or, or our neighbors, <laughs> our own family members. And in those moments, Lord, uh, we pray that, that your light would overcome the darkness, that, that your hope that you bring us would just come in and take over and transform the world, that we might be instruments, Lord, of peace, instruments of hope 
instruments of, of life-giving, life-changing transformation. The love of Jesus uh, would just uh, have a, such a strong grip on us that, that, that we, we are changed and we are changing everyone and every day more and more into the kingdom people that you call us to be. So God, thank you for that work. Thank you for today. We thank you on this 4th of July weekend for our gift of freedom and, and for the people who have made sacrifices to make that possible. We just, we remember them in the quiet of our hearts right now in this moment. And as always, Lord, we, we thank you for being Lord of our lives and for inviting us to come and pray. And we do so now together with these words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive this blessing. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. I invite you to sing with us wherever you're at, in your car or in your house, out in the boat, our closing song today. Ooh, ooh, I can see the clouds rolling. I can feel the wind. So stomp your feet and clap your hands, our feet are on the rock. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. So stomp your feet and clap your hands, our feet are on the rock. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. So stomp your feet and clap your hands. Go in peace to love and serve others through Christ. Thanks be to God.